Bernie's back, but it won't be as easy for him to win Colorado's Democratic delegates. A word about the money meant for the military in our state that's headed to the border instead. A doctor at the VA says they can and will do better. And in the Wild West of short-term rentals, a place where there are no rules, things get wild indeed. That's next. All right, let's start tonight with a pop quiz. What was the largest campaign event in Colorado history? I understand, yeah, bragging about crowd size is petty, but play along with my question. What was the biggest political campaign crowd ever seen here? Did you guess Obama mile high for the Democratic National Convention in 2008? That was my guess. I was wrong. That was about 80,000 people. Obama then drew 100,000 at Civic Center Park just two months later. Lesson here, Civic Center can fit a massive crowd of people and can also accommodate a relatively modest gathering, like, say, former Governor Hickenlooper's presidential campaign loss, launch. I am guessing that Senator Bernie Sanders is going to pull something between a Hickenlooper-sized crowd and an Obama-sized crowd tonight, Marshall Zellinger. That's a wide range, I know, uh, but in addition to crowd size, which is a completely vapid topic, you're also looking at the tougher road for Sanders to win over Democrats like he did in 2016 here. Right, and the primary reason Bernie Sanders is likely here today is because Colorado now has a primary instead of that convoluted caucus system. By the way, uh, we expect him on stage in a short while, and we'll dip into next when he takes the stage. Uh, FYI, if you're going to have a rally in Civic Center Park, don't face west where the sun is uh, we replace the caucus system in Colorado with that primary and because of that it's going to be a little bit tougher for Sanders because everyone's going to get a mail-in ballot we used to say caucuses were sparsely attended by party insiders but in 2016 Democratic Colorado caucus goers took away that stereotype packing schools hallways gymnasiums participating in a Colorado caucus system that couldn't handle the crowd Fast forward to next year, and Bernie Sanders and all other Democratic candidates for president will have to campaign like another election, because we'll get a ballot in the mail like any other election. Because it's a primary this year in Colorado, it's a much wider range of voters, most likely. It'll tend to be more diverse. Uh, it'll tend to be more non-white. Uh, there'll be more poorer people, um, more people with kids. And these are not all populations that Sanders has traditionally done well with. Kamala Harris was in Denver in August. Elizabeth Warren was in Aurora in the spring. Former Vice President Joe Biden is expected at a Denver fundraiser later this month. Colorado's switch to a March primary means presidential hopefuls have to treat Colorado more like it's November. And don't forget, now that it's not a party-only caucus, unaffiliated voters could request a Democratic primary ballot and help sway the vote. You might have some independents who lean Republican or independents who might lean Democratic, but they just don't consider themselves part of the party, uh, they'll be voting too. If there is a Republican primary, it'll be through the same mail-in process. Now, Kyle, this is either really great planning or bad planning because nobody facing this direction can really see because they're shielding their eyes with their Bernie banners. So that's great product placement. There wasn't enough room here at Civic Center Park for all the media, apparently, because I'm risking my life for this report. The odds were 50-50 that I was gonna fall off to report on this Bernie Sanders event. <laughs> I won. <laughs> I love this one. See, people, that is the value that you get from a Marshall Zellinger live report. Who else would tell you that no one can see their candidate because they have to shield their eyes from the sun and he's about to fall off the cliff? All right, be safe and shady, Marshall. We'll check in when Senator Sanders begins to speak. U.S. Space Command is setting up shop in Colorado Springs at Peterson Air Force Base, which is the place that recently had funding for a space control facility diverted to pay for President Trump's border wall. Space Command is now on par with the U.S. military's 10 other combatant command divisions. Think Central Command, which oversees operations in the Middle East, and Southern Command for Central and South America. So now, Peterson already has space control operations, this kind of work, and, and they'll eventually support Space Command's mission. Meanwhile, the Trump administration is diverting $8 million for a new space control facility at Peterson in order to help pay for his wall on the Mexican border. Republican Senator Cory Gardner is claiming credit for getting Space Command at Peterson Air Force Base. Of course, Senator Gardner also claimed credit for protecting Colorado's military bases from cuts in order to fund President Trump's border wall. Gardner said he got personal assurances. And then $8 million was redirected from Peterson down to the border wall.
It's not clear if and when Peterson will get its project. Now, if you check the fine print on Senator Gardner's promise from March, it's true. Gardner only promised to protect fiscal year 2019 spending from President Trump. The funding being diverted is from 2018. I'm still waiting to hear back from Gardner's team on whether all that came as a surprise to him. So let's look at what could be happening here. Perhaps President Trump played Senator Gardner, told him that the current year's funding was safe, and then yanked it from the previous year. Perhaps Senator Gardner played us, added that asterisk to his promise, so it sounded like Colorado's bases were protected when they really weren't. But for the service members in Colorado left waiting for the projects they were promised, whether President Trump played Senator Gardner or whether Senator Gardner played us, in the end, the result is the same. The VA says it's listening to a group of veterans who sometimes feel ignored, women. For the last week and a half, we've been looking into what it's like for women in the VA system. Today, a VA doc told our Anusha Roy, she's ready to make some changes. Something more than an expensive new VA building went up in Aurora. We listen to our veterans. We make changes because of their feedback. Dr. Shabnam Shaul said what's happening inside morphed as well to match a changing demographic. Currently have 15,000 women enrolled in Eastern Colorado Healthcare. Among those veterans is Jen Birch who brought this issue up. Veterans um, tend to fall behind in health care and mental health care. While those might not be the words Dr. Shaul would pick. I never ever want a patient to feel that way. She did say the VA expanded <sighs> maternity care, infertility treatment and senior care, especially as a number of women patients in eastern Colorado have been going up for the last 11 years, according to the VA. That trend is mirrored across the country. Is that in eastern Colorado, women's health care is so important to us that we actually made a policy in our health care system that every primary care provider will be a women's health primary care provider. That brings up another point from Birch. And I know they're trying to improve it, but they are. They're, they're behind and most women don't want to go see a male doctor. They want to see a female doctor. For Eastern Colorado, the ratio is 199 male doctors to 149 females. In Grand Junction, it's 94 to 37. But for Dr. Shaul's jurisdiction, she's clear about her priorities. As the chief of primary care, it's my priority to have the highest quality doctors. She's also just as adamant. She wants veterans to say what they need so the VA can give them the care they deserve. They are our nation's heroes and they deserve to have outstanding health care. So in previous conversations, Jen also mentioned being catcalled at a VA facility. Now, while Dr. Shaul said that she's never experienced that herself, our former medical expert said that she has. For a little bit of perspective, though, she said that she doesn't really think it's unique to the VA, but really could happen at any medical facility. Do want to point out that the VA has rolled out an anti-harassment campaign because they want all of their veterans to feel safe when they're just trying to get to the doctor, Kyle. And Anusha, the, the, the process of making sure that the VA is receptive to all veterans is something that's happening at, at the local level, also something that's happening at the federal level. Yeah, so there was actually a Senate bill that was introduced at the federal level, like you said, that would address this very thing, really assessing if women are getting the health care that they need and trying to expand some of that health care services as well. Last time it was discussed was back in May, so we're still kind of waiting to see where that goes. We'll be in touch with the parties on that to see if it actually does move forward. All right. Thank you so much, Anusha. Appreciate it. Loud parties, trash, strangers coming and going. Complaints about short term rentals in Denver are at the top of the list of calls to 311. So Denver's cracking down with a primary residence rule. It says that people can only have one short term rental, the place where they live. Our Nine Wants to Know team found a woman who learned what can go wrong when the owner does not live on site. Here's Jeremy Hahola. So apparently, according to the owner, the squatter lives back here. And I guess this might be her dog. Hi there. You seem friendly. On this day back in May, we were visiting a home in the city of Wheat Ridge where there are no rules about short term rentals. Can I come in? The owner of this property, Janelle Bartel, an Airbnb host, asked us to investigate the people inside. Earlier this year, Janelle had rented out her basement apartment. Next thing she knew, a different woman was the f want to watch something, dude? I give them some f and watch it. Fumbling with the security cameras and posting selfies in the basement. Hey, sorry, come on now. It's my name is Jeremy. Hold on, I'm 
order with 911. Since Janelle doesn't currently live in Denver, she called 911 to know for help. According to the owner, that you're squatting here in this Get property. Get out of here with that camera, man. Really? Yeah. Oh, I guess. It's I guess they don't want to talk. Alrighty. When the host is gone, you never know who may be living in your basement. Get that camera out of here. Okay. Get it out of here. All right, man. Get that out of here. Okay. All right. We're recording. Turn that camera around, lady. The law says if someone is squatting, you have to get an eviction order, which is eventually what Janelle had to do. What? It took nearly eight weeks. But finally, sheriff's deputies came to force the woman inside, a woman who said her name is Michelle Bellario, to pack up and leave. It originally started off as an Airbnb tenant who canceled and then subleased it to somebody else. And that's how we ended up meeting Michelle. And this whole process just, just drug on and drug on. Now Janelle has a friend, a property manager, to watch over her short-term rental, hoping it won't turn into another long-term headache. The city of Wheat Ridge says it tries to deal with problem short-term rentals through its nuisance laws. However, again, there are no specific laws that apply to short-term rentals like Airbnbs. Though, it's a topic that could come up later, a city spokesperson said, Kyle. Yeah, something tells me they might want to have a conversation about that. And as you pointed out, these are not instant fixes. You can't just pick up the phone and say, if somebody's in my house, get them out. It's not like a burglar, you know? Oh, no, the government bureaucracy kicks in and squatters, you know, do what they do and... This is what happens here. Wow. Yes. Ooh, they were not happy to see you, sir. Oh, not a lot of people are happy to see me. <laughs> I always am. Yeah, All right. I know you are. Thanks, Jeremy. Cure childhood cancer. You see it on license plates because of one survivor. When we got that diagnosis, life just stood still. That, that was it. And a color commentary on the CU Nebraska game from a friend of ours who's still seeing red. That's next. Welcome back for a Monday. Not so bad, right? A break from storms, severe weather, severe clear as I've been calling it all day, and comfortable temperatures that are not in record territory. 83 today will be a few degrees warmer tomorrow. Tracking a couple of isolated storms in extreme east central Colorado, turning severe once they push into Nebraska and Kansas. There's a little bit of a tornadic development up in the Midwest tonight, but Colorado looks good. And really, the focus for strong storms is east of the Colorado border tonight, and then we'll focus a bit further to the north tomorrow. That's the area where we could see storms that impact travel by air and by land. Tonight, a couple of storms near Kit Carson and Burlington. Skies clear. Push of easterly winds brings in a little bit of fog early in the morning. And then we've got some moisture coming back into western Colorado tomorrow afternoon. Tonight, beautiful. Fair skies, 55. Tomorrow, sunshine, a bit warmer. High 87. Put a 20% chance of thunderstorms in Wednesday. A fall-like day on Thursday. Sunny in 77. Beautiful weekend coming up. And oh yeah, there's a little football game. The Reichmuth family is ready to go and come Kyle, this little cutie pie has her toenails painted orange and blue. Do we love this? Yes, the answer is yes to your question. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> hey, huge road win for the CU Buffs at Folsom Field Saturday. Nebraska filled the stands with fans, and the team talked a lot of trash. Then they got to marinate it on the ride home. But Marshall Zellinger, our CU Buffs fan here, is still stewing as well. This is a story about redemption. I was floored at what I saw at Folsom Field on Saturday, and I'm not even talking about CU's incredible, inspired, come-from-behind overtime victory over Nebraska. This is about the hundreds upon hundreds, okay, tens of thousands, colored red. I'm not asking these fans to be barred, just reduced. Coming to Folsom Field should be feared, a fan base not to be ignored. Sure, at halftime when we were outscored, I was bored and getting tired, especially being paired next to this guy. Then the flea flicker, and we were fired up. You know how the game ended. We conquered our old rival and entered onto the field. Let's make coming here something sacred. Between now and 2023 when Nebraska returns, I know this problem can be cured. See you at Folsom. Marshall. Fired up. Hey, so are the Broncos who play some real football tonight. Or so we hope. They are at Oakland in the black hole. They'll kick off around 8.20. You see it on Channel 20. He's a teenager, and he's already a survivor. Not too many people know about uh, cancer in children. He'll tell us about his new challenge. And a sign that the sign is not working. Next. 
Childhood cancer is rare, thankfully. It's less than 1% of all American cancer cases. The rarity is one reason why a 15-year-old survivor, Gabe Santa Stephen from Aurora, would like us to talk more about the topic. Gabe and his sister told our Byron Reed how they're contributing to a cure. <laughs> the bond between brother and sister can even get stronger. Cancer's not easy. Especially when times are tough. It's the hardest thing we've ever done. For siblings Candace and Gabe Santa Stephen, being there for each other took on a different meeting six years ago. So Gabe had just started his, I think his first week of fourth grade and complaining of headaches and it just wasn't normal. And finally there was one day I had a bad headache. I couldn't, I couldn't stand up or anything. I couldn't hold my balance. We finally went to the emergency room at Children's Hospital Colorado. Gabe was eventually diagnosed with a stage four cancer that affected his brain and his spine. When we got that diagnosis, life just stood still. That, that was it. Gabe would eventually have to have emergency surgery. There's a lot of things going to my mind and what would happen in the future. It's part of my geometry two class. Now Gabe is 15 and cancer free and wanted to bring attention to pediatric cancer research. Not too many people know about uh, cancer in children and how we should be noticed for these things. So we went out and we got over 9,000 signatures and that was that happened through um, online signatures and even Gabe just going out to the grocery store and asking people like, hey, you know, I'm a cancer survivor and I really want to see these plates out. Can you help us? That's the uh, Cure Childhood Cancer Plate. Special plates that have recently been approved by the state of Colorado to help Gabe create an awareness of childhood cancer. I'm very proud that I was able to bring this forward and and all the money goes to pediatric cancer, cancer research. I knew there was just something in him and he was going to change, change the world. For next. And this license plate is only the beginning. I'm Byron Reed. Gabe's family says the state has registered 343 of those childhood cancer awareness plates. They need to get that number to 3,000 by July of 2023 to make sure that the plate does not get retired. We were told that Senator Bernie Sanders was going to take the stage at Civic Center Park and speak to Colorado a bit after six. It's a bit. He is yet to take the stage. But there goes State Representative Emily Sirota of Denver. Uh, her husband, the former journalist David Sirota, works on the Sanders campaign as a speechwriter. So did we go to this at the absolute worst time? Or who is coming to the stage now? Pardon me. It's too far away, and I can't ah. see. This is embarrassing. You What's all can up, see on your own TVs at home, and I can't see. Look at you go. That looks like yeah. Joe Salazar, who formerly served in the state legislature as well. Let's listen to the beginning of his remarks. I'm former state representative Joe Salazar, otherwise known as the Chicano Bernie, here in Colorado. I'm an executive committee member of the Working Families Party. Oh yeah, and one of the things that I do on the side is I sue the hell out of the fossil fuel industry to protect you guys. You that know, was Joe Salazar. Ago, we listened into we a Kamala here. Harris rally a couple of weeks That's back right. at Manuel High School. We missed her as well. Uh, these folks who hold these 6 p.m. rallies, me. we're going to learn eventually that they don't get to the Four stage years. until about 6.45. Uh, bear with us. This, pro this program is learning and evolving. We'll finish with your feedback next. Mary Rebaglia writes in, too many CU season ticket holders sold their tickets to Nebraska fans. She says we've been season ticket holders for 40 years. Would never do that. See you next time.